Hey everyone, welcome to X Bundy Diaries. My name is Ellie, my pronouns are she, her, and in this video I'm going to be sharing some more stories of growing up in purity culture. Before I begin, a quick content warning, I will be talking a little bit about the rapture. So I just wanted to give a heads up in case that's a big part of anyone's religious trauma. When I was 13, growing up in the midst of purity culture, I was extremely focused on trying to keep my mind on God and my family, rather than the growing curiosities I had about sex and romance and relationships. I was taught to take my thoughts captive, like the Bible said, and all throughout the day that was an ongoing struggle. Sometimes these thoughts that I was actively repressing during the day would surface at night in the form of dreams because when I was sleeping, I had no control over what was going through my brain. When I woke up from these dreams, I would have an intense mix of emotions. First and foremost, I would feel guilty and shameful and disgusted with myself. The other part of me was very intrigued and drawn to these dreams and trying to process these new and exciting feelings, I would write about them in my journal. And I have a few entries to share, but before I do, I wanted to tell you how I first found out about sex. Or to be more specific, the only kind of sex I was ever taught about, which was penis in vagina sex. Learning about PIV sex was an accident. It happened when I was in fifth grade and apparently my mom had a plan to tell me eventually, but she wasn't anywhere near ready. She felt that fifth grade was far too early. Personally, I now am very passionate about sexual education for children, and I believe that it should start very young and progress in age-appropriate ways as they grow up, equipping them with knowledge and empowering them Sex education in kindergarten should focus on empathy and narrating emotional experiences. Sex education in elementary school should be an extension of that and focus on how we treat each other and that it matters. We're going to get explicit really quickly. We're going to talk about anatomy. You ready for that? Okay. Sex education in middle school should include puberty education that is medically accurate and comes from credible resources. Sex education in high school should include additional information about safe sexuality practices and also continued practice on how to apply that information to the complexities of social dynamics. And of course, that idea is a fundy nightmare. Fundy parents are hell-bent on keeping sex education from their kids. My sexual education was very limited and very harmful in a lot of ways but I know that some Fundy kids get even less than I was given. As I shared before, a couple of years in elementary school, I did 4-H. I had a pet guinea pig, so I was part of the KV 4-H club. KV means guinea pig. And for one of our meetings, we had to gather some facts about guinea pigs to bring and share with the other club members. So my mom took me to the library to find some books about guinea pigs. And I remember being on the animal aisle of the library. My mom was standing nearby in the aisle, kind of supervising me, but she was also a little distracted, probably looking after my younger sibling. And as I was flipping through one of these books, something caught my eye. It was called mating. And I was like, huh, never heard of that before. What's mating? And so I started to read. This book went into very graphic detail. And as I was reading it, I was like, ew, this is how guinea pig babies are made? Gross. And so I said to my mom, mom, look at this. Look at what I'm reading. Do you know about this? And I can't remember exactly what her reaction was, but I do remember that she confirmed for me, yes, I do know about mating, but she framed it in a way that allowed me to assume that this was only an animal behavior. And it didn't even cross my mind that humans could do the same thing. 
but it wouldn't be that long before I figured that out. Sometime later that year, my mom, myself, and my younger sibling, Annie, went on a road trip to help some friends move across our state. These friends were a single mom and a daughter who was a couple years older than me. I can't remember if this mom and daughter were Christians, but I definitely know that they were not fundy like us. They may have been Catholic or part of another mainline faith, but the daughter definitely went to public school and they were far, far more worldly than us. And I think my mom had kind of a missionary stance towards them. Looking back, I get the sense that she felt like she was taking this single mother under her wing, which is very patronizing and makes me feel icky. The funny thing is this other mom was trying to take my mom under her wing, I'm pretty sure, in a different way, and I'll get to that. I remember really looking up to the daughter and kind of idolizing her. I'm going to call her Carly for the sake of this story. And Carly had had crushes and even maybe a couple of boyfriends. And she was very happy to educate me as much as she was able to. I remember her doing my hair one time and pulling out the loose strands that were sticking out of the hairdo. And it hurt and I said, ouch. And she said, beauty is pain, <laughs> which is not the best message and definitely not one that I agree with, but it's still a cute memory to me looking back. So as we were helping them get ready to move by helping pack up their stuff in a moving van, there was this box of books. And at one point it was just me and Carly in the van. And she gave me this book and said, my mom wants you to read this and she's giving it to your mom so that you can read it. And I opened it up and I was flipping through and there was this drawing of two naked people laying on top of each other in a bed. And I had never seen anything like this before and my eyes got huge. And right at that moment, at least in my memory, my mom <laughs> came out of nowhere and saw the page that I was looking at and snatched the book away and got really upset. Fast forward a few days and we're actually on the road trip helping them move across the state. And we stopped for lunch at a restaurant and we were all sitting at the table talking and I can't remember exactly how this came up, but I started sharing what I had learned about guinea pigs and their mating rituals. And I said, I'm so glad that people don't do that too. And Carly's mom said, they don't? Are you sure? And I froze and my mind started working on overdrive. And I was like, do people do that too? And I remember looking from Carly's mom to my mom and the look on my mom's face let me know that she was not happy with Carly's mom for saying this. And my mom got very tense and she told me that we would talk about it in the car. So once lunch was over and we were in the car, I asked her what Carly's mom meant. I said, is it true? Do people do that mating thing that guinea pigs do? And she didn't elaborate very much, but she begrudgingly said, yes, people do that too. And she said, but I told Carly's mom that I was not ready to tell you, and I'm very mad at her. And somewhere in this conversation, I thought of someone that we knew who was pregnant and was not married. And I brought this person up to my mom and I said, wait a minute, does that mean that so-and-so did this too when they weren't married? And my mom said, yes, they did. And I started crying. Here I was as a fifth grader, having spent almost my entire life hearing my mom yell at the TV, no kissing till you're married and cover up the screen with her hands so that I wouldn't see an unmarried couple kissing on the screen. And now, all at once, on accident, I was finding out, whoa, this is a lot more than kissing. I felt this feeling of horror and disgust, 
and confusion, it was just too much to take in. I just cried and as you can imagine, my mom didn't try to counter these horrified feelings that I was having. Instead, she confirmed it. She said, yes, this is why it is so important that people follow God's word and God's will for their life. She allowed that moment of me crying in the car to help those messages really sink in on a very deep level. Kissing and beyond outside of marriage is sin and the consequences of sinning are dire. The following year in sixth grade, I went back to the Anglican school that I had attended from kindergarten to second grade. And I haven't talked about this on my channel yet, but that year would be something that I would go on to call my rebellious year. Because during that year, I rebelled. And before you get the idea that I was smoking in a shed or something, what I mean by rebel is that I swore for the first time in my life and I made dirty jokes with my friends. That was pretty much the extent of my rebellion. Some of my friends had older siblings that either went to private or public school. And so they had access to some information that they passed along to me. For instance, I learned in sixth grade about erections for the first time. I also learned that the mating thing that humans do is called sex. So having access to other kids five days a week gave me a wealth of new knowledge. But of course, this was kids educating other kids. So it wasn't always very accurate. Pretty much every day after school, my mom and I would have a huge fight. I wanted to watch PG-13 movies. I wanted to wear spaghetti straps. I wanted to do all these things that my other friends were allowed to do. And my mom was shocked and horrified and terrified by this change that was happening in me, by these small ways that I was rebelling for the first time. And all throughout the year, she wanted to pull me out of school and she would have fights about it with my dad but they ultimately decided to keep me in. And as soon as the school year was over, they severed my ties from my friends, which was very painful. And they fully immersed me in purity culture and in the whole fundy homeschool world. And thus my whole stay at home daughter journey began. And I really overcorrected in seventh grade. I started to distance myself internally from who I was as a sixth grader. And I began to hate that version of myself. I would call it my rebellious year and I would kind of make it into my testimony that during that year I rebelled, but then in seventh grade, I rededicated my life to Jesus. And I asked myself over and over again, if the rapture had happened, you know, if Jesus came back, like the book of Revelation said, while I was in sixth grade, would I have gone to heaven? Was I even a Christian at all during that year? Because I was so rebellious and so sinful in my heart and in my actions. And I made it my mission to be a very devoted Jesus freak going forward. At the same time, my brain was still giving me all of these questions and curiosities about sex, about kissing, about romance and relationships. And my mom told me that I could come to her when I had questions and that we could talk about it. But what would usually happen is that when I would go to her with a question, she would get really upset and she might begrudgingly answer a question or two, but then she would tell me that I needed to stay focused on Jesus and that I needed to let these questions go. So it was definitely a mixed messages situation for me. 
because she would tell me, you can come to me, we can talk about this. But then her reaction to me doing that would tell me the opposite. It was not warm and welcoming. It was shaming. And I don't think it was her intention to shame me, but that was definitely still the impact. I think she wanted this really close relationship with me where I would tell her everything I was thinking and feeling, but at the same time, she didn't want me to be thinking and feeling those things. <laughs> she wanted me to be thinking and feeling very positive feelings about God and about our family. Growing up throughout middle school and high school, being a devoted and obedient daughter and being a sacrificial and selfless oldest sister was the best way for me to please and to serve God. And I loved God. I loved Jesus. And I wanted to please him and to serve him. So I constantly fought with myself over these curiosities, these questions, and these new feelings. And of course, the way I looked at it at the time was that that was Satan tempting me. But even though I was begging God for help on fighting Satan's temptation, the questions, the feelings, the thoughts would not stop. And neither would the dreams. Here's a dream I had a month after I turned 13. March 14th, 2004. Last night, I had the weirdest dream. It scares me. It makes me feel like I'm mean and perverted and very not close to God when I have dreams like that. They say that you have dreams of what you think of in the day. Well, once I had a dream that I had sex with a girl. I wasn't thinking of that. Oh, it makes me shiver to think about it. <laughs> I'm very confident that the word I meant to write was shudder. It makes me shudder to think of it, meaning that I felt negatively about it. But I love this accidental slip here. It makes me shiver to think about it. <laughs> that kind of implies a more positive feeling about this dream. And here's what I wouldn't have written in my journal. I liked that dream. In the dream, I was very into what was happening. And what I think is funny and actually pretty cool is that somehow my brain was able to conjure a pretty realistic version <laughs> of queer sex. I literally was never taught the mechanics of anything other than a penis in a vagina and the oral sex versions of people with those body parts. Looking back on that now, I'm really grateful that I had that dream. And I just think it's so beautiful that even in this homophobic, queerphobic, biphobic environment, my true self was trying so hard to get out. Back to the entry. Anyway, here's the dream I had last night, in detail, of what I remember. It was becoming the end of the world. Instead of a rapture, all of the Christians were getting on an airplane to go to heaven. Well, I was asking this woman that was also going to heaven if there would be any romantic relationships in heaven. And she said, no, of course not. We'll all just be brothers and sisters. So I guess I had a boyfriend. But at the same time, he was just a friend. And I said, it's the end of the world. You want one last kiss? And he was at like a checkout counter at a grocery store or something. And he was getting some food for the plane. And he said, sure, just a sec. Could you hold this? And he handed me some food to bring to the plane. <laughs> so I love how nonchalant this is. So I did. And while I was walking back, I remembered mom's words. No kissing until you're married, Ellie. I want you to be never been kissed. So I stopped and he came to me and was about to pull me to him. And I said, don't. And he said, don't you want to kiss? And I said, I can't. And then I put dot, 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 dot. That's all I remember. I also remember that I didn't want to kiss him because I loved him, just because I wanted to kiss someone before I went to heaven. That's what scares me and makes me mad at myself. In truth, I really wish that in my dream, he had kissed me 
so I'd experience that. I want that. And everything with the touchy-feely love language. And the way this entry ends is, oh, gotta go to Awana. I feel like that whole dream is just a big mashup of being an early 2000s evangelical kid. Like, it included my rapture anxiety, not just the anxiety of the rapture coming at any moment, but the idea that I might not be able to have my first kiss before the rapture. It's also really funny to me that instead of the left behind version of the rapture, where bodies just disappear and leave a pile of clothes behind, we were getting on a plane to fly to heaven. <laughs> which really reinforces the idea that heaven was in the sky somewhere. But I think the most important part of this entry is the way it shows my layers of shame in the dream. Because not only did I have the shame of the fact that I wanted to kiss someone, but on top of that, there was the shame that I wanted to kiss someone just to experience kissing. In this dream, this like, boyfriend guy was not someone that I loved or knew very well, apparently. And so the fact that I wanted to kiss him without the love caused me a lot of extra shame because one of the very binary messages I was being given about gender is that girls like me were not supposed to be interested in anything sexual. I wasn't supposed to want to kiss just to feel those feelings. I was supposed to only want romance. But on top of that, I wasn't supposed to want romance then at that time as a 13 year old. That was too young. That was too early. I was supposed to wait until I was of courting age to be interested in that. And even then it was supposed to be like a I'm surrendering to God and letting him bring me a husband. I wasn't supposed to be really interested in it per se, but I was just supposed to be like grateful for it when it came. There were a lot of mental gymnastics involved in this, a lot. But in my family, for my parents, they either wanted me to be 17 or 18 to start courting, depending on their mood. Sometimes they said, 17, sometimes they said 18. But to be honest, I really don't think they wanted me to court even then. We were our own little enmeshed cult and I had a very important role in our family system. They didn't want me to leave. So much so that they showed up on my honeymoon. But that is a story for another video. Even though they didn't want me to leave, they still understood that according to our worldview, eventually I was supposed to marry a dude and have a bunch of kids. And so they made it very clear that their vision for this was that they would buy this big property somewhere and it would have four different houses on it, one for them, one for me and my husband, and one each for each of my siblings and their families. They basically wanted a commune. That was their ideal vision for my future. And it would absolutely be through courtship. That was the way that I would find my husband. My parents loved courtship. They had us as a family sit down and watch the I Kiss Dating Goodbye DVD and then they talked to me about what they liked about courtship and why that was my only option for finding a husband eventually. But that I was also way too young to be thinking about it and that I needed to keep my focus on God and my family because thinking about courtship when I wasn't to the appropriate age was silly and immature and a waste of time. But it was not just my parents who loved I Kissed Dating Goodbye. My entire homeschool community was super into it. So much so that one of my homeschool academies in either ninth grade or 10th grade English class 
played the I Kiss Dating Goodbye DVD. That was part of our curriculum, watching the I Kiss Dating Goodbye DVD and then like having a debate about it afterwards on whether Christian dating or Christian courtship was the better way to go. Are you searching for true love? Let your search end here. But at 13, it was so, so hard to shut down these questions and these curiosities and the idea of having to wait until I was at least 17 or 18 to even let all of these thoughts surface made me feel so panicked and trapped and honestly despairing because it just felt impossible. And looking back, I feel that it was the repression that really intensified all of this. If it had been a natural, acceptable thing for me to think and wonder about kissing and sex and relationships, it wouldn't have felt so strong and overpowering and overwhelming. It was like a never-ending brain loop of fighting my thoughts and they would just loop right back around. A few months later, I wrote about another dream. May 6th, 2004. I just woke up from a really cool dream. In my dream, there were all these guys who wanted to marry me, but the pastor let me pick. I'm gonna use the name Sean for the kid that I reference in this dream. Sean was there and I wanted to marry him. I loved him. So then we were married. It was really cool to walk around holding his hand and it was so cool for him to say, she's my wife. It wasn't exactly a real marriage though cause I was still 13. So I only lived with him part of the time and we didn't kiss or have sex. But it was such a cool dream. I loved it and I don't know why. In the dream, I did love him, but now I'll feel weird every time I see him, especially when I talk to him. Why was it him in the dream anyway? What a perverted dream, but I enjoyed every moment of it. So you'll notice that I used the word perverted in both this entry and in the entry a couple months ago about the other dream I had. And the word perverted is pretty strong. <laughs> I think what most people think of when they think of the word perverted, they don't think of an extremely tame dream like this. But the reason why I use that word is because I felt such a deep level of shame. It was wrong. It felt wrong that I was having these thoughts and feelings and dreams. I was supposed to be able to wrestle my brain into submission so that I could submit to God and just focus on my family and the other things that they wanted me to focus on. And I think what's interesting about this dream is that I kind of feel like my brain was maybe trying to give me a little bit of autonomy and choice. For example, I got to choose who I wanted to marry. The pastor let me pick from this lineup of guys in my dream. And that's almost a little bit more like dating rather than the courtship future that I knew was ahead of me. One of the tenets of Christian courtship is parental involvement. The parents, especially the father, are so heavily involved in that process. The first person you court is basically supposed to be the first person that you marry. You court to marry. Not only that, but then I would be shoved immediately into this homemaker, biblical womanhood lifestyle and responsibility. And so, you know, dating was just for fun. 
and courtship and marriage is for godliness and sanctification and raising up an army for the Lord and all of that. So in this dream, the fact that I got to be still 13 when I was married and I didn't have to live with him all the time was perfect. I think it's so interesting how my brain in this dream was still working within the purity culture context to some extent. Like I had to get married. I didn't have a dream about being able to date, but like my brain had found like a little bit of a loophole of like, okay, we're married in this dream, but I'm still 13 and I got to choose him and I don't have to live with him all the time. <laughs> a couple days later, I was reflecting on this dream again. May 8th, 2004. It's amazing what one dream can do to you. All of the sudden, I've been thinking about kissing and sex a lot. Gross. I'm 13 for God's sake. A few things about the dream I left out because I was so confused at the time. I was sort of struggling with the fact that this was it. He was the one I would be with for the rest of my life. But I also thought, Yahoo, we're married. Now we can do all of the stuff we couldn't do before. Half of me is glad I had that dream, but the other half is disgusted. And what does it all mean? Anyway, moving on to an entirely different subject. So that was an inside look into my inner world as a 13 year old growing up in purity culture. It sucked, it was really unnecessary, and I will end this video the best way I know how, by saying, fuck purity culture, and by showing you a clip of my dog. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.